Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. We are ready and excited uh, to start this webinar. It's a very big, warm welcome from me to you. Um, and it could be a good afternoon or a good morning or an early good evening, depending on where you're joining us uh, from the world. My name is Nozipo Shabalala. And as always, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to serve you as your moderator. And we're gathered uh, virtually from different corners of the world, but certainly from different uh, corners of the continent as well, uh, to really come together at this AGRA COP27 virtual side event. And we're coming together against the theme of delivering for people and planet and with intentionality to look at the role of African women in climate change adaptation. Now, what are we trying to achieve in the time that we have together? We certainly want to create um, a space where we can amplify and we can tune into the voices of African women in climate change. Um, and I'm going to ask Professor Anthony, if you could please just mute uh, your microphone. Uh, thank you very much. And if I can get assistance uh, in muting that microphone, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, just to reiterate that we are here to create a space where we can amplify and, and tune into the voices of African women in climate change. We want to create awareness around some of the policies, the strategies, the best practice um, that allow women to really entrench their leadership roles in climate change um, adaptation. And so there's a lot in terms of the format that we're going to experience uh, right from engaging with women entrepreneurs who are absolutely at the bleeding edge and at the forefront of climate change realities. We're going to hear from uh, some keynote addresses coming from leading women who are shaping Africa's response and participation in mitigating uh, the effects of uh, climate change. And we're going to round it off with a panel discussion that really looks at climate ad adaptation, but in the context of women's empowerment. Now to you, our virtual audience, well, no, you are of course, one of the most important voices in this conversation. So I do want to welcome you, but also to ask you to please send us your questions and your comments in the Q&A box. So don't send them in the chat because we, we won't be able to see them, but uh, please send them in the Q&A box. I can see that Priscilla Okpali has already started it off saying hello to everyone. So hello back to you, Priscilla, and that's the Q&A box we're going to be using uh, for the questions. And of course, we do want you to amplify this conversation on social media. And the hashtag that we're using is hashtag value for her, hashtag value for her. To kick us off, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome the head of gender and inclusiveness at uh, AGRA. And that's uh, Madame uh, uh, Sabdio Dido, who is uh, going to come online just to give us some of her opening remarks and to get us started. Madame, it is over to you. Madam, you are muted at this moment, if we can unmute. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. You have to mute yours. Good afternoon. Uh, and thank you so much, Anosibo, for this opportunity to say a few remarks at the beginning of this uh, high-level webinar, a uh, virtual event on women and climate change. It's such an honor to, to join uh, our esteemed uh, panelists and also high level speakers. And I would like to recognize uh, Her Excellency, the AU Commissioner for Agriculture and uh, Rural Development, uh, Ambassador uh, Josefa Sacco, uh, Her Excellency, the President of our grand former Special Envoy of the UN Food Systems Summit, Dr. Agnes Kalibata. We have a series of experts on this panel, uh, on this event. Uh, uh, we have Professor mm -hmm. Anthony Young, we have uh, Dr. Tony Simons, we have a host of women activists, entrepreneurs who are very passionate about agriculture, about climate change, about restoration of our environment. Now, today is the gender day at the COP27. And from Nairobi, Kenya, we are joining our colleagues, our friends, our partners that are gathered at uh, 
at uh, Sharm El Sheikh uh, talking about how to governize, how to collect the voices of women, the voices of partners of women to really bring their collective capabilities, to recognize the vulnerabilities that they experience through uh, climate change, uh, uh, to, through uh, challenges that climate change pose, but also really to recognize the role that they play both at the household level, at the farm level, at policy level, and given an opportunity, the, how they can use their capacities to transform these challenges of our time. Now, um, we've always tried to address the circumstance of women from a women's point of view, but we've also seen that the challenges are not only with women, the challenges are with the institutions, with the policies, with the practices that we put out there. And it's high time that we bring these policies, practices uh, to meet the women at their point and to try to move together. So this uh, event that we are having today is to help elevate the voices of women. Uh, and uh, within agro, of course, we look at it from the agriculture and agri-food sector perspective to see how women uh, who are majority within agriculture and food production could participate and participate effectively, how policies could reach them, uh, could reach out to them, how practices can become responsive to them and how investments could be channeled in their direction to use their collective capabilities in climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation and response. I always say climate change justice is pretty much like gender justice because in the end, it emanates from other sources. The challenges come from within the society, but it affects women at their point, at the point where they are. Today, we are really going to hear from women leaders, experts, women entrepreneurs, the women themselves. What is the pathway for women's inclusion within climate change? What are the missed opportunities? Where are the gaps in our approaches, in our policies, in our institutions, in our practices? I know that we have such a high powered speakers today. I'm not going to take more time. I would like us to move straight to the session where we hear our speakers to learn from this, to craft a new way forward for women in climate change. Thank you very much. And over to you, Nosy. And the head of your dealer. Thank you. I don't think I'm going to be a good dealer. Alyssa, Alyssa, can you please mute? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I do appreciate that. And I'm I am mindful of the fact that uh, for some reason, um, my camera is not showing at the moment, but I'm hoping that you can hear me loud and clearly. Um, and I think I'm back on your screen. So I do want to thank and say a very big thank you to Madam uh, Sabdia Dido for really just reminding us about the significance of what does it mean to really meet women at their place of effort? And that means doing more than just focusing on gender. It also means focusing on institutions. It means focusing on policies. It means focusing on practices. And also coming in with a mindset that clearly says, uh, we know that climate, climate change justice um, is as important and in fact in the same frame as gender justice. And so we know that when we address the other, uh, it automatically gives us the capacity and the muscle to also focus on the other. So thank you very much for those really incredible opening remarks. I do want to, I just want to quickly acknowledge um, many of the hellos that have come through on the Q&A from all over the continent, from Uganda, from Cameroon, um, uh, from, um, different, from Ghana, from Zambia. Um, I see all of you. Thank you very much from Zanzibar in Tanzania. Thank you very much for being here. And we look forward uh, to some of the questions. Asana, I can see you've already started sending questions. So we're going to pick those up as we go along. For now, though, I do want to pick up where Madame Sabjio left off. And that is to welcome some of the women entrepreneurs who are absolutely at the forefront of climate change realities. I'm going to ask them to put their cameras on. I'm going to ask Madame Judith uh, Marrera 
to put her camera on, Madame Patu Mane to put her camera on, um, and Madame Lili Sing uh, Singalingele to please also put her camera on so that we can see all of them. And as we do that, Beverly in um, uh, Costa Rica and Shari in the Netherlands, we see you. And thank you for really allowing this to be a global conversation for all of us. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of one of our, these amazing entrepreneurs. But more importantly, the question we want to address is how their business or enterprise or organization is really contributing to climate adaptation and mitigation. I'm going to start off with Judith. And Judith, as you as you come on, let's be reminded, of course, that you are the CEO of Landsforce Energy uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, you, you started this business to assist women in rural communities in particular to end energy poverty. Um, and that's quite important uh, when we think about that, especially because you say your business comes from a place of um, really your own experience uh, as a woman. And so that's an extension of some of your lived experiences. The question to you, of course, is how is your business contributing to climate adaptation and mitigation? Thank you so much, Nozipo. And um, good day to everybody who's joining the call from wherever you're joining us um, uh, around the world. Landforce Energy is uh, basically participating more actively in climate mitigation, adaptation and response because we work with women mainly and because women are the people who are most sidelined in society, women and children in particular, when it comes to um, access to products and services in the, in, the, in the countries. So we are enabling women by first of all, we teach them, we empower them with skills, do, and we provide them with networking facilities so that they get to understand their role, the role that they can play when it comes to climate mitigation, response and ad adaptation. We also, we are also now trying to include women in policy dialogue because um, before women were sidelined when it comes to issues that really touch them in their day-to-day -day businesses in terms of decision-making. So we are saying women come forward so that we can work together in ending the energy poverty in, in also trying to mitigate climate change in the communities that um, we, we live. And we've managed to do this um, quite historically and um, we are keeping on doing this, uh, introducing our STEM subjects in schools, climate education for girls mainly so that uh, they get to understand how climate change is affecting them more than they are male counterparts in schools and in, in their everyday businesses. We are also training women, sending them on training to install solar, to repair solar panels, and also to become biogas technicians in the communities that we, 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 we go into. We try to make them more empowered so that they also get the skills in terms of climate adaptation, climate yeah. mitigation and response. And uh, in terms of decision-making, we are saying uh, we talk to women more so that uh, they can influence the communities that they live in, because we know that women have got more influence when it comes to our day-to-day -to -day duties in the communities that we live. So we are trying to empower them, include them, and not leave any of the women or girls out. Thank you so yeah. much for having yeah, me. Yeah, I think I think that's excellent, uh, Judith. So you spoke you've spoken to empowerment through skills. You've spoken about being intentional about including women in policy dialogues, but also about being intentional about leveraging the influence that women naturally have within their families, within their communities. And so I want to build on that by going to uh, Madame Fatou uh, next. And of course, Madame Fatou is the the, the founder of uh, Jalma Habela. Uh, from the, the Gambia. Uh, she's a professional trainer uh, specializing on entrepreneurship and agricultural training. She runs an enterprise that's really intentionally created to add value to products produced in the Gambia and really to unlock growth uh, and potential from rural women and farmers. So it's a very big mandate, Afatu. My question to you is tell us a little bit about the motivation behind starting your business, more importantly, how is it contributing to climate adaptation and mitigation? Thank you very much, um, Goziba. Let me let me say this. Um, I act because I believe without the environment, you cannot live. And I do this work for the love of the planet and the community as a woman. 
So let me just tell you the motivation behind Jelma, actually. It all started with my interaction with the women that I worked with. Like you said, I am an entrepreneur, and also my professional career, I work with the women as a climate change and, uh, mitigation trainer, and also entrepreneurship. So I reached out to the women in rural Gambia and train them on climate change adaptation and mitigation and response, looking at how we create eco, eco businesses within the community using climate friendly and sustainable agricultural um, and also climate practices enterprises. But then when you look at that, uh, my interaction with the women realized that um, uh, our women in the Gambia would like spend six hours in a market, in a congested market, just to earn five dollars a day out of the sales of the half. And when you look at that, um, the reality is because our, those half that have been grown and harvested by those women are not value added, like they just sell them fresh from the market. So this is something that um, I thought of and I said, I can do something about it. But then I further went on to do research to see what I can do better. But within the research, I realized that um, our GDP, like when it comes to value addition, contributes only 5% to our GDP. It means we are an import-based economy. We solely and purely um, based on import of goods and services to our country. So when you look at that too, as, it, as um, a tea company that is um, just started not long ago, I look at the, um, the statistics of tea import in the Gambia. We spend about $23.9 million yearly on tea import. So in the global market, um, we are the sixiest importers of tea in the whole market, which is really very sad. And it's an opportunity for us as an enterprise to start something um, 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 productive that we can also work with the women that I work with as a trainer to be able to start something sustainable and something that would also give them a livelihood. So this was an ex economy benefit from my end. I said, okay, this is a challenge that I can take up and work with the women. We commercialize them and put them into a platform of um, women farmers where they will grow a lot of herbs and our, and our enterprise would buy those herbs and process them into tea bags and sell them to the market. So um, in terms of um, climate change mitigation and adaptation and response, um, aside from my company, I work with an NGO called Boss Women. So what we do is we go to rural Gambia. We localize the trainings to, to the context of the women and we use the local language that that they, that, can, that they can understand better and we try to educate them on climate change using the curriculum that we have developed within our organization that talks about water preservation, pollution and environment consumption uh, and also climate change mitigation and response strategies that we can use as women to be able to work and also mitigate because I believe that if women are not taken care of in terms of um, um, climate change mitigation it's come a big issue because we are the one that, that face the challenge on a daily basis. Thank we you are very the ones much. who face it on a daily basis. So it's important that we educate them and empower them to be able to know what is really happening around the globe. And this is what we do at, um, at Jelma and also as, at, as a trainer with the boss women in the um, organization in the Gambia. Thank you very yeah, much. Fatu, I think it's excellent. So an identified export opportunity and more importantly, going to women where they're at. And that means going into the rural uh, uh, part of the country, making sure that you're localizing the training, making sure that you're delivering it in the local languages, and making sure that women are active participants in uh, the creation of a green economy and an export capability into uh, out of the Gambia, rather. So, Lily, let me come to you uh, next as we as we as we wrap up this teaser panel, because we know that you are the CEO and the founder of Green uh, Agriculture youth organization out of Zambia. You're an agronomist uh, by profession. You are um, a CEO. You are an award-winning entrepreneur. You're currently running the Voices for Just Climate Action Zambia and really tapping into communities. And I think we'd be here for the rest of the afternoon because you're just so busy and doing so many things. The question that I have for you, though, is um, just tell us a little bit about your organization and in particular, um, how it is promoting um, uh, you know, the, the fight against climate change and the combating of, uh, of climate change. How are you going about doing that? Thank you so much, Nozi, for that great question. So I'll just give you a, a brief background about how the Voices for Just Climate Action Zambia started. So this is a, uh, a project that is focusing on strengthening the capacity of vulnerable communities to raise voices to duty bearers and decision makers on the effects of climate change that affects their livelihood, resilience and demand climate adaptation action. So we are actually focusing on three thematic areas. So we have food systems, we have energy and we have uh, gender. So on food systems, what we are doing is that our aim is to, to build demand for sustainably produced food 
We also want to strengthen our local value chains. We want to improve nutrition and as well as promote the reuse and recycling of food resources, especially among the most vulnerable. So when it comes to energy, we are looking at the agents to elevate to clean cooking energy as a nation. So we want this to be pursued as a development priority, and then it should be made universal access to everybody who is living in these communities of Zambia. Then when it comes to gender, we are actually developing the voices of a woman and the youth so that they can advocate for climate change in their local communities and build networks of like-minded and them, like them to amplify their voices physically and digitally. Thank you very much, uh, Lily. I think that's a really succinct uh, way of showing us how the work that you're doing is so closely aligned to development priorities, food systems, and gender, um, gender as well as energy. Um, so thank you very much for that. So ladies and gentlemen, the intent of that panel is really just to uh, whet our appetites. It is a teaser panel uh, as we prepare for our keynote addresses. And of course, also pay, prepare for the second and final panel that's going to come after those keynote addresses. I do want to say, I've seen a couple of comments, uh, Fatu, Judith, Lily, um, that have come through to say, please share your contacts. How do we get a hold of you? How do we partner with you? So I'm going to ask that each of you, please, in the Q&A, if you don't mind, would like to share your web address or any other details that you'd like to share with our global audience right now, uh, they would be keen to connect with you. And maybe to close it, uh, to close it off, um, I just want to pick up a beautiful comment from Marie Rarea. And Marie was saying this, she says, agriculture is the oxygen that drives the economy our, and our women are at the center of climate change and need to be empowered um, on how to be leaders in this regard. So Marie, I think you've captured it beautifully. And more importantly, what we're seeing from this teaser panel is that women are leading. Women are in those uh, important spaces. The question is, how do we entrench and how do we amplify and how do we support? Um, as uh, Madame Sabdio said, by bringing institutions, practices and policies closer to these women. All right, so we're going to transition now uh, towards our keynote addresses. It, and I'm going to start off by inviting our very first speaker, and that is none other than the president of AGRA, um, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, uh, who we know has served as uh, Rwanda's Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources. We know has one of the most influential women on the continent. But suppose in this conversation, especially in this timely moment for the world, as she participates at COP27, we know her to be one of the leading women who are shaping uh, the narrative around climate change adaptation and responsiveness. So Dr. Kilibata, we'd love to give you the floor as we listen in to your keynote address, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nasifo. Thank you for being part of this conversation tonight. And uh, I want to start by thanking everybody who is here tonight and really congratulating and welcoming uh, Commissioner Sako, our leader in the agricultural sector. And I say congratulating very deliberately, and I'm going to give you uh, a few reasons why, um, as I welcome you all to this platform. Um, back in March uh, on Women's Day, um, we had a meeting like this where we were talking about issues to do with women empowerment and getting women more engaged in the agricultural sector and supporting women businesses. And Commissioner Sako challenged us. She said that as we come, we look towards uh, COP27. Uh, one of the challenges that definitely we'll be talking about and the reason these COPs exist is the climate change uh, that we are facing in the agricultural sector and really bringing out and being intentional around how we bring out women voices, ensuring that, uh, that, that we provide a platform that allows that process to get women voices out to be, and to ensure that the process and the meetings happen in parallel to COP27 so that these voices, as they come out on these platforms that we provide, are in parallel, but in and in support and, and really adding voice to what is happening in the meetings at COP27. These women, many of the women that are on the platform today may not have made it to COP27, but they do have a voice and their voice counts to something, their voice is important in the decision making processes that happen, and their voices represent the impact that we all see around us. So we are extremely grateful, Commissioner, for the leadership you provide here. I've seen you running from one meeting room to another meeting room, 
whom I've seen your crops, trying to keep everybody engaged the right way for the continent, but also then finding the extra time to talk about women and nutritional issues uh, is something that we're extremely proud of. We, I, I wanted to make sure that um, without going into the details of uh, how climate change impacts women, which I will leave many of you, I just wanted to call out two opportunities that I see. Uh, one of the biggest opportunities that women do produce 70% of the food that we eat on this continent. So if we want them to do a good job, we really need to advocate to ensure that the agricultural sector stays stable and is able to deliver and help them deliver. Women are the backbone for our nutrition, and we want them to do a good job in feeding societies and, 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 and children and not make the decisions to reduce food and sometimes not to eat. We need to ensure that we are that there's climate justice that ensures that, that we, we have stability and, 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 and clear, uh, a clear sense of direction when it comes to how we need put food on the table. The last, the biggest, probably the biggest opportunity that I see from a climate perspective is that, no, from a, an agricultural perspective, is that agriculture and systems do represent a 13, a 13 trillion dollar industry, an industry that employs 40% of the world's population. We definitely can do better if this industry is focused on ensuring that we reduce our part of contribution to climate change, which is huge. Uh, if, if we focused on removing the impact of climate change coming from agriculture, we'd contribute 37% to net zero. At least that's what the IPCC report says. But to be able to do that, we'd have to invest significantly in making the sector work for the people that are most impacted especially on the African continent. So this is for us, and I guess for Commissioner Sako as well, this is about giving groups. This is about giving you all an opportunity to speak up and give your voice and say what is working and what's not working. Let's look at the solutions as well. I know we are heavily, heavily, heavily impacted. And yes, we sometimes don't even know how climate, where climate change is coming from. And if you look at 48 African countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are contributing less than 0.5% to the changes in the climate. But if you look at the impact there, these farmers are suffering the most. So how do we, what is the solutions? What are the solutions we find within ourselves? And what are the solutions we are looking for from the rest of the world? That's what this conversation has to be about. So thank you so much, Nazifo. I could, again, I'm really working very hard not to be prescriptive and put answers on the table. I really want to listen to everybody else and give everybody else a chance and opportunity to, to, to tell the world what they want and what they want to see, especially now when the, the whole idea of staying within 1.5 is becoming elusive. We cannot have an Africa I don't know how we'll exist, to put it differently, I don't know how we'll exist if we are not able to stay within 1.5 degrees. For Africa, it's, and it's something we can't envision, but also for women, it, it would be a nightmare. Over to you, Nurse. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalibat. And of course, this conversation all about what can we do to avoid the nightmare? How do we better support women already at the for, forefront, already in um, positions of influence within their families and communities. And Dr. Kalibata, thank you for starting off with the numbers because it always gives us the opportunity to go back to what does the data tell us and how do we then respond from a da data-driven perspective in terms of the responses and the, the initiatives that come from all of us and from the range of different sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to move on to our second keynote speaker and that's Her Excellency, Josefa Sacco. She is, of course, as we've heard from Dr. Kalibata, our AU Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment. And uh, Your Excellency, we are really excited to hear from you and to hear from your insights. So we would love very much to hand over the floor to you now, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, I'm just wanting to check in if you can hear us. I can see your camera on screen, but it does appear that you might be frozen. Thank you, Thank you Nozipo. Can you hear me? Zipo, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Mm 
Nos can you hear me? You, you hear me? Ex yes, Your Excellency, Hello? we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, because there's a lot of noise here in the pavilion. Uh, Dr. Agnes Kanilibata, dear sister, Agra president, our distinguished panelists, all protocol duly observed. Today is gender day, so I will start by congratulating all women. I thank Agra for coming with my office host this virtual side event at COP27 to spotlight the role of women, women's leadership in climate change mitigation and adaptation actions. It may be recalled that on the 8th of March this year, AGRA held a joint webinar with the African Union and the Egypt Minister of Environment, who is the host of uh, COP27, and uh, one key call for action during the webinar was to amplify women's voice at COP27. I am delighted that this call is being actualized today. Congratulations, my sister, Agnes. Climate change continue to be a global threat amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and conflicts. In spite, of the, in spite of contributing very little to the global greenhouse gas emission, Africa suffers the highest repercussion of these shocks and stress, uh, stresses due to its high explosion and limited capacity to cope. We are all aware of it. Women are almost bearing the brunt of climate change. We can recall that, that uh, women in Mozambique went through, went through during uh, the cyclone Idai, as well as current split in the recent flooding of Nigeria and Pakistan and drought in the Horn of Africa. As a result of the, dry, the drying of uh, Lake Chad, some of the kidnapped girls from school for, by Boko Haram are still missing. The empirical evidence indicates that climate change affects more negatively compared and more negatively, sorry, compared to men in five impact areas, health, water and energy, and climate-related disasters, migration and conflicts. And conflicts. In the agriculture sector, women being the most active actor are being with limits uh, access to and the control of uh, productive, productive resources are also the most exposed and vulnerable to climate change. How then do we, do we, do we change this narrative? So let me share four points with you how we are, we are proposing at the African Union to, share, to change this narrative of really women being impact, uh, impacted by, the, by, by, by climate change. Women are very often in the front line of uh, livelihood and uh, ad adapting to the effect of climate change. They are powerful agents of change and promoter of adaptation and mitigation action. They have indigenous and local knowledge and skill related to water harvesting and storage, food preservation and rationing, and the natural, natural resources management. This knowledge and experience should be uh, uh, harnessed to make lasting and uh, scalable changes. We must, number two, my point number two is, we must amplify the voice of African women in climate change to create awareness for policy, strategy, and practices while entrenching their leadership role in climate change mitigation, adaptation, and responses. We must ensure that we have enough women negotiators at COP28 next year. Mainstream third is mainstream gender in climate smart agriculture. We have a high level, a high level event by Nordic and African leaders on why women is key to the Greens transition on the 15th of November uh, 2022. That is tomorrow. We have this high level. Uh, this thing. I invite all of you to participate in this high level uh, uh, side event. 
a three, a four. Finally, there is a wealth of uh, reliance, disaggregated data, and evidence on the impact and may change on women. This is one area Agra and its partner can assist us with because we have we need the disaggregated data. That is very important because when we are do presenting our annual review report and of, of our accountability, we need to have disaggregated data in, in order to have real a real uh, um, evidence based uh, cases on our report. So this is very important, and we are really making a call here for Agra to assist us in having it is aggregated get the data at the African Union Commission under the Department of Darling. The African Union is ready to col uh, for collaborating on this, and we look forward for all a good a good outcome of this event. And then we are really committed to, to continue this journey together. I thank you for your attention. Your Excellency, thank you very much. And some uh, really incredible reminders um, about the significance of uh, this COP27, but in particular the cost significance of the conversation around uh, the role of women reminding us that we have a duty to amplify voices, that we still need to mainstream gender issues, the job is not yet done, and of course that aggregated data is the only way we get to box smartly because we are working from a data-driven perspective. Your Excellency, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your time and appreciate uh, your keynote address that you have shared with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're shifting gears now uh, towards our panel discussion. I'm going to invite our panelists to kindly please put their cameras on for me. I'm going to invite Dr. Uh, Susan Chomba, who I saw online, there she is. She is, of course, the director at Vital Landscapes um, um, at, World Re at the World Resources uh, Resource Institute. And we'll talk a little bit about what they are doing to contribute to resilient food systems. We are also joined by Dr. Tony Simons. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Center for International Forestry Research and World Agroforestry. And uh, I think he's going to, he's putting his camera on. There he is on your screen. And we're going to be hearing from him um, as well around how their organization um, has really risen to the challenge. Um, we also want to uh, invite Professor Anthony Okonyong, who I also saw a little bit earlier on my screen. Professor Anthony, let's welcome you back. Uh, Professor Anthony is a senior director uh, for Africa at the Global Center on Adaptation. Professor Yong, uh, Nyong, thank you very much uh, for being with us and we appreciate you being here with us as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we, we don't have a lot of time, so I do want to get very quickly into it, but I also want to take some of your questions. So please send me um, even more questions in the Q&A and if I can slip something in, I'm certainly going to do that. And to my panelists, you're more than welcome to keep your cameras on so that we can really simulate this idea of being around the table and having a conversation. Dr. Susan, I'm going to start off with you and I'm going to invite you just to share with us um, how the World Resource Institute is addressing the climate change crisis. And in particular, how is that? how are those efforts contributing to resilient food systems? I'm keen to know whether there have been successes in this regard that you could also highlight. Thank you so much, Nozifo, and uh, greetings to everybody from Sham, uh, Sharma Sheikh. Um, let me reiterate uh, Agnes Kalibata's uh, comments that really, uh, when I am here, I'm constantly conscious of the role of African women on our food uh, systems uh, from production to marketing and also very conscious of the few representation of African researchers and particularly female scientists in this kind of international fora. So if we have women producing 70% of the food that we eat on the continent and the sector uh, employing 50% of the women uh, in the production side, my question is why does that graph then tend to go very, very low when we have when we look at the number of women scientists that are then producing the evidence, the synthesis, the research that is needed to drive our food systems transformation. So it is a call to all of us who are in different institutions to recognize that huge gap and do all that is within our means to increase the number of women scientists, because we do need not just the voice of women, uh, but also their expertise in defining food systems transformation. So 
In terms of World Resources Institute, um, uh, we are working very, very closely. So for instance, in Kenya, we have the Food and Land Use Coalition, which we have Agra and GAIN as our partner. And we are really launching a platform that is going to help build the synthesis, the evidence that is needed, model the kind of food system transformation pathways that we need uh, for Kenya as a country, but also we are thinking of other countries that are in the pipeline. Uh, we know very well what the food situation is currently uh, under the 1.2 degrees Celsius. We know it's gonna get worse uh, when we get 1.5 degrees Celsius, a goal that is still quite uh, far uh, over our reach. And we know that if we go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, it's bad enough now. We've seen the drought situations in our continent. We've seen flooding in places like Nigeria. And we have to be able to think 10, 20, 30 years from now, not just be reactive and trying to, uh, to, to, to react to the situation, but also think about what kind of food systems transformation we need. So uh, WRI as a research organization, partnering with other research organizations, national as well as national research organizations, one of our key priority in the next five years is to help the continent to model sustainable, resilient food systems transformations pathways that are informed by our understanding of the African context, that are informed by our understanding of our social, cultural, and economic dynamics, and are not necessarily informed by other uh, vested interests that we've seen on the continent. So that's number one. A other bit of our work that is very closely related is on our landscape restoration initiatives. We've started very much from the environment side and we are coming bringing our expertise on environment to the food sector. We want to see restoration that has positive impacts for food security in the continent. We just don't want to count the number of hectares that have been regreened or the number of trees that have been planted. We know very well, and I'm very, very uh, delighted to know, uh, you know, Tony Simons, uh, director, former director, C4 ECRAF is on board. We have so much evidence from C4 ECRAF that gives us evidence of tree crop interactions, tree livestock inter in interactions, and that it's not just enough to have trees in the systems. It's enough to ensure that we have the right tree in the right place for the right purpose. We can reduce our uh, nitrogen, uh, synthetic nitrogen significantly if we invest a lot on agroforestry tree species that help us to fix uh, you know, biological nitrogen into the system. We can save money for farmers and we can be able to build the soil health in the long term so that we are having less negative effects from, uh, from excessive internal ex external inputs. So really uh, on restoration, we are big. We are supporting AFR 100 continent-wide, but also in specific countries to ensure that the kind of restoration that is happening is going to have positive impacts on food security. Now, Zifo, and, and allow me to, to list the last one, which we are very passionate about, and I know Ambassador Josefa Sako will be very keen. We just opened, uh, we just uh, launched the African uh, Climate Change Strategy here at COP, and she really graced the occasion. And so the third one I'd like to mention is about trade. Trade is crucial. We have an opening here in terms of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. It is supposed to help us remove the tariff and non-tariff barriers to allow African countries to trade amongst each other, shorten our value chains, increase domestic uh, uh, you know, revenue. But the question is, what is going to be the implication of the Africa for Free Continental Trade Agreement on smallholder farmers? And that is a question that we haven't figured out. WRI is conducting research on that to ensure that we are not just focusing on the higher level, but also on the impacts on that on smallholder farmers. Thank you, Nozifo. Thank you very much, Dr. Susan. And a lot of resonance, I'm looking at the chat and the Q&A to what you're saying. So firstly, we have a burning issue, and that is the issue of the insufficient rep representation of women researchers and scientists. And as you said, that there were a few comments in the Q&A to say, I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, but I don't have access to a mentor. I don't have access to networks and so on and so forth. Of course, you've also spoken to us about restoration that actually matters. And, and, and that's a very important conversation that I'm hoping we have an opportunity to scratch at. And then of course, 
course, um, lifting the, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and saying, have we asked the question about what this means for smallholder farmers? So let's 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 build on that. But let me go to Dr. Tony uh, next. Uh, Dr. Tony, when I look at the name of the organization you represent, I always say I think this is probably the longest list of acronyms. But I think Dr. Susan said it beautifully. Um, as she said, C4 ECRAF. But we know that you've been. Um, you mean you've been working in uh, this particular issue for over 27, close to 30 years. Um, you've been looking at topical agriculture, at forestry interface, um, and you've been doing this across a range of developing countries, I think almost close to 40 uh, developing countries. My question to you now is that considering the history of C4 ICRAF and the fact that these two once separate entities have joined forces, how has the organization in its reconfigured uh, form leverage these combined strengths to address the climate change crisis? And how is that contributing to resilient food systems today? Great. Thanks very much, Nozipo. And thank you to AGRA and ARB for inviting me to contribute to this amazing panel and amazing um, think session. So you're correct that we merged in January 2019, C4 and ICRA, two former independent organizations. That decision to merge came from the bottom up, largely from staff, from partners, our supporters, our host countries, and our beneficiaries. And what they said is we needed to be more credible, more relevant, more legitimate, and more investable. Those, those were the stretch goals given to our leadership and our board. And within that, then, that need for change, okay? So to see, changes in behavior, in attitudes, in habits, in policies, and in investment, and communication, including in gender aspects. And for an institution working on the continent since 1977, we took it as an opportunity to say, what is our strategy like? How is our strategy aligned with the climate needs of, Agri of Africa, particularly on adaptation? How is our strategy aligned with the gender perspective? And not just from our own staff, but from our partners, from our leadership, from keeping that gender disaggregated data that uh, um, I, Commissioner was speaking about, um, and the need to make sure that, that we are doing the right things. Because we, we all have biases and discrimination, sometimes neglect and, and lacking diagnoses. Now, if those are unconscious, somebody needs to hold a mirror up to us. But if they're deliberate, that's really where we need to change. And so we took that as an opportunity to say, well, if there's a link between gender and poverty, then there's a link between climate. Uh, sorry, if there's a link between climate and poverty, then there's a link between gender and poverty. If there's a link between climate and productivity, then there's a link between productivity and gender. If there's a link between climate and stability and, and conflict and disaster and sadly also violence, then we need to change that. So we can be as morally earnest as we want. It's the right thing to do. We need to think much clearer about equality. It's not just the right thing to do or to do for allocational inefficiencies. It's the thing to do for synergy. And that is where we can bring together the efforts of women and men together for those stretch goals, for that greater interaction, so that we know, you know clearly through a lot of data that we do have, that the climate burden, the climate risk, the climate responsibilities fall on, on women more than they do on men. And so we know also that women are more inclusive, more nurturing, more equitable, more uh, avoid negative competition, more accepting. And those are the behaviors and attitudes and changes and habits and policies and investments that we need together for the continent and together to put those land-based activities in the, in, in the frame of people, of the stewardships of the land. And what a more exciting place to do than in Africa. Yes, it is cash poor, but it is so asset rich. And a key part of those assets are people. And more than half of those people are women. And so we talk about capacity building, capacity training, et cetera. There's so much capacity. It's got to be about capacity mobilizing. So how are we going to mobilize the youth and the women uh, groups to make sure that we're capitalizing on this upcoming 
climate dividend, this, this opportunity. So let's just look at the negative side, but those opportunities to leverage all of those wonderful assets that, that Africa has together. And it, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. It's a delight to be invited to be part of this, not just conversation, but this growing partnership and very action-oriented partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tony. I think one of the th first things you said as you've responded, you, you described this as a thinking session, and I think that's exactly it. You've given so given us um, so much to to think about. Um, in particular, the lessons that we can take from the um, the bottom up um, impetus for the merging of those two organizations and what it tells us about the possibilities when we begin to look at the different links between gender and other social aspects. You've also spoken, of course, about the fact that we need to go beyond um, beyond allocation inefficiencies and look for synergies um, and how do we leverage those synergies. And interestingly, in a, of course, given the urgency, the burning issues of this particular um, uh, of context of climate change, it's not often that we're speaking in positive uh, in positive terms. And so it's really refreshing to hear you talking about how do we mobilize capacity and how do we do that so that we realize a climate dividend. It's a conversation and a narrative that I think needs a whole lot more airtime. So thank you very much for that. Professor Anthony, let me come to you. Um, and of course, Prof, as you come into this conversation, we know that you've, you come in with more than 30 years of experience in environmental and natural resource management. Um, and so the, the question that I want to bring to you is to really look at the Global Center on Adaptation, the CGA, and to ask you, how are your programs um, um, really accelerating climate adaptation and supporting Africa to build resilient and green pathways? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nazi. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to speak on gender there, I'm a very strong advocate of gender, having headed the gender unit at the African Development Bank several years ago. But let me just step back a little bit to say that we have crisis on our hands. And the crisis is that, look, for most of us from developing countries, particularly those in Africa, we bear so much adverse impacts of climate change. But global attention is drawn more into mitigation just about 7% of global finance goes into adaptation, and that's very low for most of us. And so the Global Center on Adaptation was established to change that narrative, to drive more resources, accelerate adaptation the more. And then what we have done is ask ourselves, where do we start from? It's a global initiative, but let's start where the needs are, and that's in Africa. So we partnered with the African Development Bank to set up a program called the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. The goal is to mobilize $25 billion over five years to drive adaptation. Why are we so interested in this? I think it will help shift the needle from the syndrome of 3% that Africa is suffering from. And I tell that, this, I call it the syndrome, the 3% syndrome. Why? Because Africa contributes 3% to global warming, accesses 3% of climate finance, we are told that at least 75% of the resources to address adapt climate finance, uh, climate change will come from private sector. But what is the private sector's contribution to climate finance in Africa? 3%. So we have just 3% in everything. And we think this program will do that. So we partner with the African Development Bank. Why? Because they have shown the leadership that we need to work with. The first is that they are the first MDB to have achieved parity and exceeded the parity where climate adaptation finance exceeds adapt uh, mitigation. Two, they are one of the very few institutions that implement the gender marker system that basically identifies and prioritizes investments that will improve the uh, gender equality, target women the more, and then the third program they have is what we call the AFAWA, the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa. $500 million facility targets just women to expose them to the market. But having said that, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program looks at four key things that we will do with this 25 billion that will drive adaptation globally. The first is on uh, climate-enabled digital agricultural technologies. 
most of our farmers are smallholder farmers who sit and we pray. Pray for rain to come. Pray for crops to grow. Pray for everything to happen. And when it rains, we eat. If it doesn't rain, we starve. We shouldn't be in that space anymore today. So we've seen what others are doing. Having looked at the indices of 54 African countries, actually 53 that submitted, looked at the NAPS, looked at national climate strategies, looked at the African Union climate change strategy. We identified these four pillars. The first being agriculture. That's what everybody wants. So how do we ensure that we drive the adoption of technologies in agriculture? When we did our assessment, we found out that the men adopt more than the women. And we've identified the challenges that the women face. And we're addressing those challenges, influencing projects. The second thing we do for is we realize that 70% of Africa's infrastructure is yet to be built. So we do realize it's better to do it right up initial than to want to retrofit. And this infrastructure comes with implications. For instance, we take roads. We decided to do with requests from the government of Ghana, help us, we flood a lot. The Accra cities you know, are constantly flooding. Right now, my country, Nigeria, half of it is submerged. What is the situation? What is the problem? What is the risk we are facing? What is the cost of that? And what are the solutions? When we finish that program, having looked at it in a combined climate change and gender lens, we found something very interesting. Ghana is doing well in urban infrastructure, those six lane roads, those four lane roads. But the women in the communities are not using those roads. They use the footpaths. They use the on third road. That's who takes them to their markets faster, takes them to the clinics, you know, takes them to the water wells, and these are being left. So it was an eye opener to the Ghana government that a lot of those women will not have access to health facilities, access to school and all that when it floods, much more than the men when you think you address those roads. I'll quickly finish. And the third thing, which I'll soon round up, is uh, young women and men, the young ones. Africa's median age, 19.7 years. These are very young people. That could be a disaster or it could be an asset. And we've chosen that it will be an asset to government. So what we've done is that every project we intervene in, we, I, we create jobs. It's compulsory, it's mandatory that we must demonstrate how you create not just temporary jobs, permanent jobs in that space. And not just all jobs. It's easy to create jobs in mitigation, solar batteries, panels, name them. But in the adaptation space, it's difficult. So we are pioneering that job creation in that space. But then many of our youths don't want our jobs. They're entrepreneurial. So we are driving an agenda. We launch a program called the Youth Challenge, Youth Adapt Challenge. We started last year. We selected 10 out of about 4,000 candidates to give about 100,000 and one year of mentorship. Out of the 10 we selected, eight were women not through affirmative action, just openly, you know, going through normal jury selection to check their, the quality of this project. We are amazed that women given this opportunity could actually come up with adaptation solutions that are so groundbreaking because that's where they're operating. And most of them were in agriculture. So it tells us that the women who farm these plants know more about the solutions to those problems. And given the opportunity, think freely, they came up with brilliant ideas. This year, we've given 20, and about 75% of them, again, are women. So finally, on finance, women are not accessing finance enough. So we've also created instruments, targets, you know, uh, opportunities that would allow women to have access to finance from established international organizations, but importantly, from national governments, because they owe the women and the people these responsibilities to make finance available to them. Thank you very much for uh, Prof Nyong, thank you very much uh, for that, because you've given us, uh, firstly, you've given us a, a, a term that we're going to now be focusing on, and that is how do we 
how do we cure ourselves from the 3% syndrome? Uh, because certainly that seems to be a key challenge on the continent, but also just outlining and unpacking very succinctly how these funds uh, to drive uh, climate uh, adaptation are going to be allocated. And it's really interesting to see the emphasis on uh, agriculture, digital uh, agri-technology, infrastructure, young people, but also access to finance, which are some of the key issues that we keep hearing coming up in this conversation. Now, I probably have just about 10 minutes or so with the, with, uh, for this panel. So I want, I want to try the impossible and that is have another round of questions and uh, really pushing this time that we can get, um, you know, to get some more responses from you. So I wanna come back to Dr. Susan. Dr. Susan, as I said earlier, there was a lot of um, response and reaction and resonance to some of the comments you made um, around your first point of the, the, the lack of representation among researchers and scientists. I want to hammer in on that um, a little bit. And I want to ask you that given your global um, viewpoint and experience, um, are there any practices that work? Are there any research findings that say, well, if you want to increase women's representation, if you want to support women in leadership, whether that's in climate action or another space, these are the ingredients of how to get it right. Do you have anything to share with us uh, in that regard? Thank you, Nosifo. And um, I think a lot of us in this call, and especially the you know the fantastic panelists and keynote speakers here, will be leaders uh, in their respective organizations. And just to share my reflections, perhaps as a you know as an African researcher, uh, you know I've worked with ECRAF, you know, and uh, you know Tony Simons was my DG. And um, I have, I think, some experience here that I can share. Um, first of all, is really, um, you know, building African uh, women researchers, being very, very purposeful, uh, taking affirmative actions in every organization, from right from the time, you know, girls step in school all the way to university, and when they step into the job market, it's very, very much important that a lot of us who are in positions of of leadership recognize how much it has taken that girl child to get where they are and really support them. So what kind of support? Recognize performers. Uh, I think there's a, there's a research that was uh, produced by World Economic Forum really showing that uh, women, even in research organizations, who contribute just as much in terms of publications, in terms of fundraising and other you know, indicators of performance, tend to get less promotion than their male counterparts. This is not Susan. This is science that is showing it. Uh, studies that are showing you know, sim similar levels of performance by female scientists, but less, uh, you know, um, you know, access uh, to leadership uh, in, in a lot of uh, places. So um, the other thing is to be able to really uh, understand what it requires uh, for women um, to be able to, 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 to rise that sometimes in our job, uh, in our job places, we have to recognize the, the differences that we have. So if a woman, for instance, needs to take time off to, you know, to, 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 to maybe in terms of family matters and when they come back to the workplace, nobody should be penalized uh, for just be playing a critical role of ensuring that our families are, you know, they are well taken care of, uh, that we are bringing up families even as we are working. I think we need to be aware of these kind of differences and creating the enabling environment in the workplace for women to be able to thrive but also recognizing when they perform that they need to be, uh, and, and of course, that also means financing whatever women are doing. If it's in, in you know, places like the COP, the reason why a lot of African scientists, women scientists are not here has to do with the finances. They couldn't afford to be here and that's crucial. Thank you, Nozifo. Yeah, Dr. Susan, thank you very much. So being intentional about affirmative action, um, making sure that women don't b bear the brunt of the family penalty and, and financing. Uh, the efforts of women to be in the spaces where decisions are made, to be at the center of the conversation. I couldn't help but think, as you said, this is not Susan, it's science, that it's an absolute hashtag. Uh, hashtag this is not Susan, it's science certainly is going to be something I hope that you're going to latch on to, but because it, it certainly has a ring to it. Tony, let me come back. To, I, I want to come back to you. Um, and again, I want, to, uh, I want to double click a little bit on this idea of focusing on research and, and case study findings from your own experience. And the question to you is, 
have you come across any data research that points us in the direction that says, well, if you want to incentivize uh, women's leadership and empowerment and climate action, this is what you've got to do. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, think about participation in groups. Wherever you go in the world on a field trip or you have a, a, a day out and you see fantastically successful communities, households, societies, cooperatives, it's where there's a strong gender balance. I mean, it's obvious where we're seeing it. And we need to bring the, all of those experiences, all of that narrative, all of that anecdotal work together to make sure that, look, this is what we can do. We need to be able to go to the Minister of Finance to say, take out a loan on gender synergy in agriculture, in green infrastructure, in climate, climate adaptation, because the loans that were taken out for, for, for normal infrastructure have gone. And with the youth coming through and more gender equity and gender equality and gender synergy, we're going to be able to do that. So it's not going to be me that is. It's going to be very successful people like Agnes and, and, and Susan and uh, Josepha that can do that and, and put it in front of those ministers to make sure that we're getting that. And that will be the, the real opportunity when we can see that. If I can just share with you briefly uh, one slide, just one slide. This is the narrative that we have. We've got a baseline where women have less influence, less resources, we need to change it. And when you present to men, well, you know, we're gonna keep the same total and we're gonna take a little bit off men and give more to women, you know, there's not much of an incentive there. So then we say, okay, well, let's incentivize men by having, you know, let's go for a stretch of, of a greater total of six, you know, a 50% increased productivity. But that's missing out. That's missing out on the huge opportunity for that synergy to make it multi multiplicative, not just additive. And who is going to be those people that can convince the Minister of Finance to take out the loans so that we can show this and have those data sets? But anecdotally and through experience, we see that but we really need to draw it out and bring it into the narrative. So I hope that helps elevate it and sorry for surprising you. No, I think it was a beautiful surprise uh, to see the image on the screen there, Tony, for all of us, because it really speaks to the power of what, how we, what we can get right when we look at things from a multiplicative uh, lens rather than just an additive lens and actually just really think through smartly how do we create those particular incentives? Um, and I think this is probably going to be an equation that many of us are going to be carrying in our back pockets on the back of this conversation. So thank you very much uh, for that. And of course, you've made you've made the the, the good point that um, it you know one of the, the the observations or more consistent observations is the observations of gender balance, um, and and that fits in beautifully with what we've been hearing from Dr. Susan around being intentional and purposeful around affirmative action. I want to, I want to come back maybe to um, uh, Prof. Anthony once again. Um, and Prof, you know, you, you listed a range of uh, different, uh, well, you, ra you, you, you raise a particular program in partnership with the AFDB and how the allocation of resources would be, would be there. I want to go back, uh, back to the, the, C the GCA. And I want to maybe ask you to, to lift Presence. Yeah. Yeah, I think we lost Nazi, but please go ahead, uh, Professor Anyo. Okay, thank you very much. I guess it's about uh, some of the uh, concrete programs we're doing. I just talked about the uh, Youth Adapt Challenge which is very important. We talked about the uh, agricultural programs that we in, are implementing. With the African Development Bank, we have about 270 million projects in the Horn of Africa, where we are building in the use of digital solutions that was not there before. And we have several other projects that we're working on to expand uh, the opportunities you know, of, for uh, adaptation that wasn't there in those projects originally. And within 18 months of our establishment, we've been able to influence positively through our investment about 3 billion worth of uh, 
and uh, this climate action project. That's one thing. But what I also want to really dwell on quickly is that look, we are solutions broken. We have seen if Africa was an airplane, we would have so many pilots around all through. Because when you come to every part of Africa, you see pilots this, pilots that, pilot programs on this. Every institution comes to the continent, picks one little thing, does a pilot, it works, and we move on. There is no uptake, there's no scaling up. There are so many initiatives that could change this narrative we're having today if only we were able to scale up. So the Global Center on Adaptation as a solutions broker, we are identifying through what we call the state and trends in adaptation knowledge exchange, scouting around, you know, what are those successful projects that are all over the world? Why were they successful? How can we upscale them and introduce them into the larger projects of the MDBs that do multi-million dollar projects? So that's one good thing, or one other good thing that we're working on, that those things that have remained pilots, we're taking them up and we will embed them in bigger projects so that they can be scaled up. And I'm sure once we do that, we will be able to scale women's access to finance, women's access to resources, and actually designing and implementing projects that work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those remarks. Again, you raise a very important point. Right. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nyo and uh, Dr. Tony and Dr. Susan. Again, very, very valuable inputs from your own experiences of the work that you have led within your institutions. And I think, uh, Professor Nyo, your last uh, message to us about the fact that we are actually just doing pilots Pilots are critical. Of course, we do appreciate the fact that pilots give us uh, uh, lessons and insights into how to take some of this forward. But the important thing is how do we bring this to scale? And, and I think that is a challenge, especially when it comes to climate change adaptation. We work within the sector agriculture and we're looking at all these small solutions that are dispersed over the place. So the question is, how do we take this to scale? Because in the end, that is where systemic changes happen. I'm so glad that Nozibo is back. Uh, so let me hand back to her. I believe we are heading to the end of this session. Uh, Nozibo, over to you. Thank you, Madam Sabdio. I'm also glad to be back. Um, I, some of the technical gremlins kicked me out. So Prof Anthony, I do apologize. I didn't hear the, the response to that. But I think it is a reason uh, to keep in touch and to find out what your answer was exactly. Um, and it does bring us actually to the perfect timing of the end of our conversation, because at this time I was firstly just going to um, acknowledge first and foremost the global audience that we've had because they've sent through some excellent questions and comments that we unfortunately we didn't really have time to delve into. But I certainly hope that uh, the agro team is going to be in touch, uh, respond to some of those questions, but more importantly, maybe redirect some of those questions to different members of the team um, so that they are answered because I thought they were all very, very impressive questions. And to close us off with the closing remarks, um, before I invite our speaker, I do want to say a big thank you to our panelists, to Dr. Susan, uh, to Dr. Tony, and of course to Prof. Anthony, for your contributions uh, that have been absolutely insightful. You've given us so many nuggets. And standing by now is um, the Vice President for Strategic Partnerships and Chief of Party at AGRA. And that is, of course, uh, Madame Vanessa Adams to give us her closing thoughts and reflections. Over to you, Vanessa. Wow, what an amazing group of speakers, dynamic participants, such insightful comments. Um, it's not Susan, uh, uh, it's science. I'm, I'm a hashtagger, I'm all about that. Uh, and I really appreciate um, the, the flexibility. I don't think any moderator could pop in and out and pick up where she left off. So thank you so much, Nozifo, for your fantastic 
uh, uh, energy and, and flexibility. Uh, and Sabdio is always there. You know Sabdio will jump in at any time and moderate and <laughs> wrap up. But I just thought I would look at this from a, from a criticality point of view, the urgency. Some of what we're talking about, people feel that has been said again and again and again. So where's the change? Where's the progress? And how can we work together to really pull leapfrogging and catalytic change? We talk about now only eight harvests remaining to 2030. We, we all said we would have equitable, uh, uh, equitable uh, uh, gender equity, right? Under the SDGs. We said that without gender equity, we couldn't even come to the sustainable development goals. And that's before climate adaptation and climate change and resilience had the level of urgency that we're talking about today. Now we're talking about reaching a, 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 an environment where climate change is not a question, it's a norm. It's a lack of rains, we talked about it, desertification, we've talked about erosion. Now we're talking about adapting and who are better prepared than women to be adaptive, to be innovative, to come up. And this is based on science, uh, hashtag science, not Susan. Um, but I, I want to reiterate that um, the kind of innovation and resilience we see with women entrepreneurs and women farmers and women village uh, and community advisors still tends to be a bit tentative and a bit competitive with women competing with each other. And what I really wanted to call to your attention is the, the, the financial and numerical synergistic equations that Tony put in front of us. Because everything that's going to see change occur. And we've seen it time and time again. It's evidence-based leadership. It's evidence-based policies. It's evidence and, and leadership which are enabling us collectively to see that change be measurable. And many of you were with us around the annual um, AGRF summit in, in September in Kigali. And we were talking there about high level women leaders who actually make a difference when it comes to nutrition, who make a difference when it comes to policies and financing and investing in women. And so I think collectively, we always say manage up, right? We want to manage up. What can we bring forward to the leaders amongst us that they can act upon, right? All of us have leaders that we look up to who can make a change and make a difference. And this is really why Value for Her platform was created. And it's why I think we want to see more engagement around practical, practicable solutions which can be scaled significantly. And now we're talking also about women sourcing from women who can make a difference new technologies available in rural last mile uh, critical environments. The world is going to continue to challenge us and we have to step up to the plate. And so I'll be right there. Um, and I know you'll all be right there with us. And I really, really encourage all of us to pick a few battles we know we can win. And then let's measure and be proud and stand up on the mountaintops and make that difference. So please join us online on Value For Her. If you're not, please tweet out your ideas and we'll retweet you. And uh, if you're in the background and you haven't really thought, what's your message? What's your battle cry? Where's your passion? Bring it out, try it out, and we're ready for you. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Before you all disappear, can I ask all my speakers to please put their cameras on so we can just take a quick group photo. Um, if you're still there, I can see. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalibata. Um, and uh, Dr. Susan, you're still there. Judith Fatu, thank you. Lily, thank you very much. And I know that the team in the background is busy pressing click, click. So if I can ask us just all just to give them a big smile. Um, Dr. Kilibata, I'm going to ask you to look into your camera for two seconds, and I think that's it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.